Cool. Thank you, everyone. So I'm the only thing between you and lunch, so I will try not to bore you too much. So are we OK to switch to the slides? There you go. Perfect. So first of all, who am I and why I'm standing here? So I'm an engineer based in London, originally from Barcelona, worked in New York and uh, Switzerland as well. I've co-founded this company called You Can Cherry, which is a consulting company. I'm working right now at Trainline, uh, which is the biggest train uh, website in, in Europe. It's fairly entertaining to, to work there. I've been working 19 years as a sysadmin. So if you ask me about racking modems, I will bore you to death about that. And also I worked at Canonical where I uh, helped found Juju and Mass Metal as a Service. And from there I've been uh, helping companies transform and add DevOps teams like, for example, a Rackspace. I uh, created all the DevOps infrastructure that they're using right now. And been doing DevOps for since 2009, more or less, when it was called WebOps. So it wasn't that much into dev yet. I also run a meetup in London called London DevOps. So if you're around there, besides visiting the Queen, of course, uh, you can come, stay at your meetup, uh, feel welcome. There's free beer, free pizza, and interesting talks, or at least we try to make them interesting enough. Uh, we run every month and we're in meetup.com, so feel free to visit. So just to keep everyone active, I'd like to do a first show of hands. So who here runs infrastructure in the cloud, any kind of cloud? Okay, that's more or less half, that's very good. Okay, so you know what kind of problem this cloud has, right? Cloud is hard sometimes. It's like riding a broken bike. Uh, you try to add your servers, you're trying to give proper DNS names to your services, then suddenly you get an email from AWS or from Rackspace or from Azure that says, hey, by the way, this instance will be killed in 12 hours, best of luck. And then you need to change everything again. It's, it's not so good. And someone needs to keep mending and attending that. So how do you fix all that, right? So I'm here to propose a solution. Well, you, we're kind of expecting that, right? And the solution is survey discovery. So who here hasn't heard about survey discovery yet? Raise your hands if you haven't heard about survey discovery. Everybody knows? Wow, very nice. So uh, what we do is we automatically define our services, we update DNS automatically, we add and remove services through health checks, and on top of that we have an API so we can check everything that we want through the API, automate all of that, include all of that in all our applications, so it's, it's fairly good. So let's say that in layman terms, if you want to define server discovery, let's say that we have three different uh, service nodes, so that would be instances or containers, everything you want, and all of those go to a service publication mechanism. So the way this really works is that you have a health check in each one of the, of the nodes that will check for your service or the health of the, of the container or the instance itself. Then those health checks will report back to a discovery agent then this discovery agent will uh, check all the different checks, will check that everything's okay, or if it's warning why, if it's degraded, et cetera, et cetera. And once it has checked everything, it will send all of that to the service publication mechanism. So that means that service will go in and out as, uh, as they get uh, those services healthy or unhealthy. On top of that, the discovery agents also check one another so it's not only a question of every discovery agent checking the, its own cluster or its own instance. It's also a question of all of them checking one another, make certain that everyone's healthy. And the first time I checked this was around two years ago. That was my face, literally that one. So in case that's not clear enough, this face. It was very good. It was very cloud friendly. Uh, you can use all of that to make certain that your services don't break. So another example of that, just to reiterate, if we have all these nodes running this service called web with all these APs, you don't have to remember all those APs you ask through DNS or through an API where are all my APs for my web service, you will get all of these. If one of the nodes go down, one of the APs will immediately be removed from that list. So any services that consume that will get only two of them, and the third one will disappear. Then someone will be notified about that, an alert will be raised, or it will recover automatically if you have full uh, health uh, active orchestration, and then this node will come back again, 
and you will have again the three IPs ready for you. And again, this phase. So not only that, but it's, it's fairly smart, I would say, for some networks like in AWS uh, or other cloud providers have, for example, in DigitalOcean, they had some problems with that. This is fairly network active. And as you know, um, cloud in general and containers, if you really like to mess with your networks, the networks can be quite unstable. So what the agents do is that they keep checking randomly for their neighbors. They check that their neighbors are okay, then they check for all the neighbors that they are okay. So what happens if one of the neighbors suddenly disappears? And disappear can mean anything from the instance crashed, from that service went away, to I actually stopped the service because I wanted to do something in the machine. Then suddenly, the neighbors will realize that this machine is missing, and then they will report that to the cluster, and they will put this machine as failed. So then, it has a grace period in which it's failed, so no traffic will go to it, but it won't be out of the cluster itself. And when you fix that, you go back to it. And by now, this face is already kind of imprinted in me. So now that we know more or less what server discovery does on the 10,000 foot view, I would like to talk a bit more about which kind of discovery solutions um, you have. And this, of course, is you can choose whichever you want. There's no right or wrong one. It's just getting the right one that fits for what you want to do for your architecture, for your application. So I won't go and say, this is the best, or VI is better than Emacs. Well, I will actually say that. But um, it's up to you. It's up to what does actually fit what you like. So the ones I personally recommend, because I've worked with all of those, is console. CoreOS fleet and the Kubernetes service definitions. So all of them have different strong points. So in, for example, in the CoreOS fleet, uh, you define all the services. And when you deploy the services themselves, you're, the, you're defining also all the health conditions for that service. So it's fairly ingrained in how CoreOS works. And the same for Kubernetes. In console, it's a bit more um, optional. You can define a service that is always up, or you can define a service and attach health checks to that service, so it can go up and down for you. So what are the strong points of each one of them? Uh, console, the thing that I really, really like is that it has a strongly consistent key value. Um, so that's good, because not only you can define your service through a catalog, but also you can add all kinds of metadata to that, and you can use that in all your platform. In CoreOS, it's the same. It uses etcd for being strongly consistent. They had some issues like a year and a half ago where etcd wasn't strongly consistent and had some um, reconciliation problems that resulted in lost data, but they're okay now, so please don't panic. And in Kubernetes, uh, you don't have that. You would need to add that on top of uh, what Kubernetes does already, but it's always a good thing to have. And if we talk in Puppet terms, all of them have Puppet modules, and that I know at this console and CoreOS fleet do have through ETCD to have higher access. So you can integrate higher with those key value stores and then make Puppet listen to that information and react accordingly. So I'm slightly opinionated. I like everyone to use what they want, but I have my own opinion as well, right? So I chose console. And not only because I think it's the best solution for what I want to do, but also because I written the higher module for console, so hey, a bit of a bit of self self loathing is always good. So what is console, right? It's a service discovery system, as you didn't know by the title of this talk. Um, it publishes all the services through DNS, which is very good. It keeps the DNS zone separated, and also through the API. And the API is accessible from each one of the clients, so you don't have to go to one central place to query that. You can query it from your machine. It has a strongly consistent key value storage, which I will talk a bit about later. It does have health checks, both for the nodes and the services themselves. And it has encryption, which is amazing, because if you're dealing with credit card information or you're dealing with information that you don't want the NSA to get, it's important to encrypt everything. So the thing that made me decide about console, first of all, is this website called um, Call Me Maybe. 
Uh, I know that the, it's, it's, the song is from a title, but it's actually a very interesting website. It gets different databases and data storages and compare them, uh, compares them one against the other and puts a lot of stress on, on them and see how they break. So for example, they found some problems in the Elasticsearch replication mechanism that were quite horrid. So that made me reconsider my replication strategy for Elasticsearch. So if you have some time and you want to laugh a bit because the guy has a great sense of humor as well, go and visit this website. So he did a comparison between ETCD and console around a year and a half ago and he discovered that console was actually strongly consistent. So there was a very few milliseconds difference between writing data to a node and all the cluster having that data in a consistent way, where ETCD had some synchronization problems that meant that if you had network partitioning while at the same time writing data, you would lose the data. But I said, they fixed that now, so don't panic. So there's some high-level concepts that we need to know about console before getting into it. Uh, so the most important one is the data center. So as you, console, as any other service discovery mechanism, is a, is a grid system. So all the nodes talk to one another. So a data center will be the minimum unit where all the nodes can speak to one another. So for example, in my case, that would be a VPC in Amazon. In your case, it might be something else. But consider that the data center just being something where every node can speak to one another, at least through some ports or filtering or something like that then you have every single node that runs the console agent. So whenever nodes are, are spin up, they declare themselves to the master service, so they automatically appear on the, on the node list. And then what that means is that they will be immediately available and everyone else will start checking that they are healthy. You have all the health checks, uh, which can be a set per node or per service. You define health checks the same way you do in Nagios or Isinga or Sensu or your tool of choice for monitoring and alerting. Then you have watches, which is a very interesting thing. So what a watching console is a non-blocking waiting query, which this means is that if you want to check for any kind of reaction when information changes, you can do that with a watch. And then you say, once this information has changed in any way or form, execute this code or do this thing or alert this person. And then on top of all of that, with the key value store, you have the ACLs. So the ACLs uh, will keep all your information that needs to be secret, secret. So you will be generating tokens, which are UUR, long UUIDs. And these long UUIDs will be used to, uh, to check for the validity of your, of your token to get that information. So in order to maintain all this key value store consistency, you need to have what is called a console master. Console masters are nodes that are only, the only specific thing that they do is to maintain the consistency of the whole cluster. So normally you can run with one node in dev or in test if you want, or you feel suicidal in prod, it's up to you. But the minimum that I would recommend is three nodes to maintain quorum. If you run four nodes, better, because that way you can lose one node and the quorum is still maintained. In production, if you want to be extra paranoid, I normally run five nodes in production. So I have a minimum quorum of three nodes, then I can lose two nodes, or Amazon can kill two of my nodes, and I can still be fine. And then you have these three nodes, or four or five nodes, maintaining all the consistency across all the console agents. So the console agents are each one of your nodes or pods or containers that you run. They will register themselves to the master nodes. Not only that, but if you want to replicate across data centers, you can as well. So if you want to maintain consistency for your information, it's not done automatically, but you can do a replication of information between one data center and another data center. And also all the ACLs will be automatically replicated for you. So console has a DNS publisher, which of course it's not listening port 53, otherwise it would break your DNS server if you run one. It runs on port 8600. So normally what I do is that in, if you run Linux, I use DNS mask, mask for Linux. On Windows, there's nothing really similar to that. So the solution that I found is that you can make console listen on port 53 and be a bit cheeky about that but otherwise you can use your Active Directory to forward your zones. So, as I've said before, 
the way console publishes the DNS service is fairly good because it maintains its own TLD, which is dot console. And then you have inside there your zone, which would be your data center, and service on node and the service name. So if you have a service called web in your data center that is dev BPC, for example, or dev network, it would be called web.service.devnetwork.console. And also, you can query the catalog in any of the, of the machines. All of them will be listening in port 8500 for the APIs through HTTP. And you might need a token to order, in order to access them if you want strong security, but you have all these different things in the catalog. So in the catalog, you have all your data centers, all your nodes, all your services, all the definitions for a service and all the definitions for a node as well. So the most important thing about console for me is the health checks. The health checks is what keeps all your data center and all your nodes sane. And uh, what this means is that what you need to do for these health checks is that you need to define the minimum necessary to define the health of your service or of your node. Let's say the same that you would do for a smoke test if, you, if you're running a smoke test in your code. So it's the minimum that you say, if this fails, this node or this service won't work at all. It will be a disaster. I, I've been a bit cheeky in the past myself. And what I've done is that I've defined all kinds of service checks and health checks. It's like, well, yeah, this one is if only if it's degraded 25% or if it's degraded 50%, but it will just go to warning. And what I discovered is that console will take that as a fail and will remove the node away or the service away from your node. And that's not a pretty situation to be in. So my recommendation for this is make certain that any check that you have is the minimum, minimum necessary for that to be working. So to reiterate that a bit more, let's say that you have your server, and this server would be a big box where you put all your checks that only affect the server, like memory, disk, CPU, load, or lock checks. Normally these days what I do is just check for disk, that I can actually write to disk and that the disk is not full, because all kinds of bad things happen when your services run out of disk, or you can write to disk. And all the rest, I just leave my monitoring tool to, to check for me. And then on top of that, you define your, your health checks for your services. So the health check for your services will only apply to the service. So you're going to have a node where you have more than one service. And if the health check is for that service in special goes away, the rest of the node will be fine, but that service will fail. So this we use, and it's been fairly useful for us to do green-blue switching or to do canary deployment as well. Because with this, what you can do is declare a service as fails, then install the new one and remove the failure condition. So this way, you ensure that you're putting traffic away from that server, installing the new version, and putting traffic back. And it's a very neat way to do blue-green switching. So once you get all these, um, I will go a bit deeper into the API. So the API not only has a catalog, it has all kinds of things. So you have ACL definitions, you have the status of your agent in the catalog, you have a slash KV, which is what I use most, which is the key value store, and also you have all kinds of health check reports straight from there. And as with any application nowadays, you need to API all the things. I'm completely in favor of that myself. So anything that is not in the, in the API, if you don't find it there, Raise, uh, raise a problem with, uh, with the project or anything like that because anything that is not there that is useful to you, it's a problem if it's not there. It's not, it's not you, it's a problem with the software. So up to here, you've seen all the puppet stuff that I've been talking about, right? So now we'll start talking about how do you apply all of this to puppet, which is what you're interested in. So I won't try to run a demo of all of this because the last two times that I run this talk and I tried to do the demo, the just crapped beautifully. So I wouldn't even try to do that. If you want to try the demo, I updated it yesterday, so it runs Puppet 4.7. So if you download that uh, repository, it's a vagrant uh, definitions and all that with Puppet that spin up four machines for you, three console masters and one web server. And you can play with it, you can break it, you can add all kinds of stuff. 
So, modules. The modules that you can use for all of these. Uh, so there's a very good module written by Carl Anderson for console. It's heavily maintained. It's one of the approved modules by Puppet Labs as well, which is good. There's the higher module, which has not been approved by Puppet Labs. Please do. And um, there's also modules for accessing the key value access and also the templating. So there's a lot of people that use console template to template configuration files with information you get from console, be it from the key value store or be it from the catalog itself. So let's start with the Puppet module itself. So in case you haven't used the Forge before, which I don't think anyone here hasn't, um, you can install it just by running that. Then, of course, you can download the NS mask. The module from SAS is the one that I found best for this. Um, there's one only small caveat. If you're running Red Hat, it does horrible, horrible things to the NS mask. So please be aware of that. Um, I find myself in a situation sometimes where I have, didn't have a DNS for water by accident. So be careful with that. So you can define all the DNS mask stuff like this, just therefore water for console would be like that, fairly easy to do. And then we start adding health checks. The good thing is that the, the console puppet module supports health checks and it's the central part of that. So you can run a console check, for example, this space, and this would be a console node check or a container check. So this will be a global check in, in your machine. And this check will run as any other monitoring tool, like for example, check disk. I use the Nagios ones for these. It's 100% Nagios compatible. So console will recover the same uh, exit statuses as Nagios does. And this will run every 30 seconds. It can run every second if you want. It's up to you. And then we can define the services. So in here, I define just a very basic service. You can declare the ports for the service. In this case, I declare port 80. Right now, I think the module doesn't support yet adding more than one port for that service. So you pick the one you like best. And then you can add tags on top of that. That will be in the key value store. So you can say, this Nginx is for my web accountancy or is for my web portal and stuff like that. And you can search in the key value store for those tags. And then you can attach checks to that. So all these checks that you define here will be part of the service. And you can add any that you want. So normally I run one or two tops because I said I don't want to kill the service uh, without realizing. So with all of these, then we can integrate with Hyra. And the way I normally do that is that I don't only keep all the console definitions, I also keep the Hyra YAML definitions on the side. Because what I do is that I use the Hyra YAML definitions to keep all the things that I know that are, let me say, mostly static about my services, like my BPC ID, the IP ranges of that BPC, stuff like that, that doesn't need to change that much. And this, I use console for all, all the really reactive, active stuff, like all the different uh, servers that are defining the service, or all the different stuff that comes from uh, all the tools that we have that keeps up being updated every minute. In order to install that, again, if you haven't used the Forge, you can just run that command, and it will install my module into your machine. You can add the module to the, uh, your higher.yaml. Um, I don't know if this might be slightly obsolete, but nonetheless, he, here is it. Um, just in case the screens weren't big enough, which is not the case here, I've made this bigger for you. So what you can do, this console um, higher module is, does HTTP requests to the API. So you need to specify the host and the port of the API. You can define if the failure is graceful or not. I normally set it in graceful, but if you, define it, if you don't define this as graceful, Puppet will stop running if it can't access the console API. So that's, a, I would say, a safe method if you want to make certain that you have that information available. And then you have all the paths that you're querying through the API. My default is to query the service catalog and the node catalog in order to look for all these different nodes that have services. So one of the things then that I can do with this is start generating templates through Puppet in a very dynamic way. So for example, as you know, when you define a RabbitMQ cluster, you need to add all the APs of the RabbitMQ cluster to the configuration file. So 
since I'm using console to define all of this, I will look in Puppet for all these. I added this helper uh, function inside the higher module. And then you can just run console info, and it will return back with, an, with a Puppet array that you can use to inject into your, into your configuration file. If you want to do a bit, something a bit more complex, for example, in Neo4j, I found that they don't only want the IP address of the service, they also want the port, which um, is a bit uh, messy to do, right? So this, here you have an example that you can try, which what it will do is actually use the standard lib join function to get you both the address and the port, build an array of that, inject that into your template, and you have a template that will automatically scale all across your Neo4j machines. What this means is that when, whenever you add a new one to your cluster, in the next Puppet run, all the machines will already have that new one. So it's kind of neat. If you want to expand this a bit more, you can use um, the higher configuration to talk to your key value store. So for example, at Trainland, we have all kinds of information in the key value store as we use console itself to run all our deployments. So we write all the status and all the fi uh, final state data into console itself, and then all the servers catch up, including Puppet. So we use Hyrule with that, and we access the key value store as well. So the way the Hyrule module will work is that it will go through all these different paths, the same way your Hyrule hierarchy goes through, and whenever it finds the key that it's looking for, it will return that to you. So you can you do that, you can add your stuff, or if you want to be a bit more neat, you can add variables like your environment variable or any other kind of stuff, and it will automatically expand to the right one. So who's with me still? Everyone? Good? Excellent. So now we'll talk about um, the final part, which is Puppet security. So I'm very security conscious. Uh, not because I travel to the US enough to go through customs often enough to be asked questions, but also because I think security is very important for any information. You don't want your information to be out there. So one of the things that I've seen in the past is this. You run all your code in Puppet, you start adding all your passwords because, hey, it's GitHub, right? Nobody will ever check that. And then you push all your passwords in clear text to GitHub and you have it on your repo, and not only that, but on the history of your repo as well. So the last person that did that ended up like this. It's like, don't ever do that again. So the good, the good news about this is that if you have all this information in Hyera, there's ways to encrypt this information as well. So the modules that I use most is Hyera-Iyamo, and I've used as well Hyera-GPG. Both are fairly strongly secure. And personally, I use more Iyamo because it's easier to, let's say, transfer all the different keys to everyone in a secure way, at least for me. So then all these higher architecture will end up like this. You have Puppet, which will talk to higher using eYAML, which also supports YAML, so it's a win-win, so you don't have to encrypt everything. And then that, at the end, will talk with higher console. And the good thing about this is that you can also encrypt all the information in console, and it will come back and be decrypted by eYAML. I tried that and worked last time. Might not work now. So if that's the case, please raise a, an issue in the project and I will try to fix it. So again, the way to install this, Puppet install, module install, hire a YAML. You will also need to install the YAML gem file and then that will get you a, in a YAML binary. So the first thing you need to do is to create your keys. These keys will be uh, in your Puppet Master, or if you're running Puppet Masterless in all your machines, so make certain that you protect them appropriately, and do you separate your secrets properly. So one thing that I do, for example, is that I use different keys for my dev, staging, and production environments. So this way, even if the information is out there, it's encrypted with a key that nobody has unless you're in the right VPC. You can do a lot more stuff with that. So iyamo itself supports editing the files, and also, also supports um, piping information. So you can pipe stuff into the YAML binary, and it will uh, show up in the other side completely encrypted. The way this works is that you use YAML the same way you use, but when you have the value, you need to add this deck, column, column, PKCS7 stuff, 
and inside the brackets you put your password or your information. And what that will re become is this. And as you can see, that's slightly more protected than having your, your password in clear text. And that's very awesome, but if you wanna do even more secure stuff, what I do recommend is Vault. I tried very hard to incorporate higher Vault support in my module before the conference, but I failed spectacularly. But I promise you that it will be there soon. Um, if you want to hear more about Vault, I recommend that you go to the Seth Barker talk, which is tomorrow at quarter, quarter past 11. And he's from HashiCorp, so he will know all kinds of things about this that I don't know yet. And it's very good, you can encrypt data, but also you can generate credentials on the fly. So rather than having to spread a database user to everyone with the same password, then someone leaves the company with that database user, which is a bad thing to have. You can generate credentials for applications that only will be valid for a certain amount of time. So you can be as paranoid as to renew those credentials every hour if you want to. And that's it. So I will have now 15 minutes for Q&A. If anyone is shy enough to not like a microphone, I will be around afterwards. Can you write the same thing for Eureka, please? Sorry, what's the question? Yeah, it, yeah, it works. Yeah. Can you write the same module for Eureka? <laughs> so if I can write the same module for my? Uh, Eureka is the Netflix SDS, yeah. and that's yeah. how, what we happen to use. This is amazing. I would love to see it for other service discovery services. Are you open to forks for that? Yeah, of course. Um, so this module itself, uh, so the question is if I can write the same module for other service discovery mechanisms. And this module itself is forked from the Hira HTTP module. So any kind of forks, any kind of features, or anything, or if you want to go ahead and be a forge author yourself, it's, it's fairly easy to do. And the community has been incredibly active, so I've got all kinds of PRs and suggestions that have been made to the module. Anyone else? Hey, uh, for me. <clears throat> so in the brave new world of Docker, things could run on arbitrary ports. There's no, there's, there's not a strictly defined port necessarily. You know, you can have dynamic ports. Is there any way of dynamically discovering ports in console and, and then passing that through at the moment, or is that something that's coming down the pipeline that you know of, or how how would you do that? So the question is, if there's any way to dynamically discover port services in doc in in console. The answer is yes. The, whenever you define a service, you can define the port attached to that service. So it can be any port. It can be the port that you run in internally on your, uh, on your container, or it can be the port that your container exposes to the outside world as well. So you can define any kind of port that you want there. Uh, console is very heavily used in the Docker world, uh, as it's the main competitor with etcd for all kinds of Docker-related metadata. So I'm not the expert on Docker. There's one guy here called Maxim that sits on the second row, that he's my favorite Docker expert for this, so he can give you a bit more detail. Have we looked at config4j? For, uh, that, that's like a Java library for integrating with console. So can you repeat the question? I'm getting a lot of echo, so. I'm Do you have any experience around CFG 4J? Uh, that's a Java library for console yeah. integration. So you're asking about Neo 4J? Or? The config 4J. Yeah. It's a, it's a Java library to integrate this with the applications at the upper, upper level, I mean, at the higher layer. So if I understand your question correctly, is that if I can use data in console that ties directly to the application rather than yeah. Puppet? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, you can do that. Um, there's a project in console called Console Template that uh, what it does is exactly that. So you don't need Puppet for that. If you need something that has uh, templating that needs very quickly changing, like query be mutating, you can use that. You can use ConfD as well for that, or you can use a project that we just open source at train line called AppStreamer. So this, what it does is that it reacts to console information and updates a template outside of Puppet as 
a running puppet every second or every two seconds would be too costly for any kind of infrastructure. So it depends on what you need. If what you need is something that mutates once every 10, 20 minutes, or once every hour, Puppet would be the good fit. If you, seen, if you need something that mutates every three seconds, then you need something else. Anyone else? So if you have any questions on your dish, I will be around here. Perfect. Cool, thank you.